Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. It's a great memory verse, isn't it? From start to finish, today's passage has it woven through almost every verse. Jacob has now served his uncle Laban for 14 years and he's ready to get out of there and go back home. And who could blame him? Despite what we know of Jacob, the deceiver and the grasper, he has fulfilled Laban's every whim. Before we even read today's passage, we know that the relationship between Jacob and Laban has been pretty strained, to say the least. We heard last week how Laban and Leah too tricked him and lied to him. And Jacob has had to work for his uncle for the past 14 years because of those lies. And it amazes me just a little bit that Jacob fulfilled his end of the bargain. He worked those 14 years, as far as we can tell, without trying to cheat Laban or to pull any of his shenanigans. But now he's fulfilled his obligations and he's ready to leave. Let me pray and then we'll read. Father, this is your word. And even as we read this story from thousands of years ago, we know that you mean it for it to teach us because these things happened, uh, they were written down, and they have come to us who are living at the end of the ages for our instruction that we might walk in the way of truth and trust in you, our Lord and our God, with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. So we pray, Father, make these words profitable for us. Amen. Genesis chapter 30, uh, verses 25 to the end of the chapter. Um, There is a lot in here. I'm not going to apologise that this might be a slightly longer sermon. And even just sitting there watching Stephen's um, fantastic children's talk, I even thought of another couple of things that I'd really like to say, but we don't have time. Maybe after, at morning tea. (laughs) Verse 25. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, "'Send me on my way so that I can return to my homeland.'" Give me my wives and my children that I have worked for and let me go. You know how hard I have worked for you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favour with you, stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Then Laban said, Name your wages and I will pay them. So Jacob said to him, You know how I have served you and how your herds have fared with me. For you had very little before I came, but now your wealth has increased. The Lord has blessed you because of me. And now, when will I also do something for my own family? Laban asked, what should I give you? And Jacob said, you don't need to give me anything. If you do this one thing for me, I will continue to shepherd and keep your flock. Let me go through all your sheep today and remove every sheep that is speckled or spotted, every dark-coloured sheep among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the female goats. Such will be my wages. In the future, when you come to check on my wages, my honesty will testify for me. If I have any female goats that are not speckled or spotted or any lambs that are not black, they will be considered stolen. Good, said Laban. Let it be as you have said. That day Laban removed the streaked and spotted male goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats, every one that had any white on it, and every dark-coloured one among the lambs, and he placed his sons in charge of them. He put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob. Jacob, meanwhile, was shepherding the rest of Laban's flock. Jacob then took branches of fresh poplar, almond and plain wood and peeled the bark exposing white strips on the branches. He set the peeled branches in the troughs in front of the sheep, in the water channels where the sheep came to drink, and the sheep bred when they came to drink. 
the flocks bred in front of the branches and bore streaked, speckled and spotted young. Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face the streaked sheep and the completely dark sheep in Laban's flocks. Then he set his own stock apart and didn't put them with Laban's sheep. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob placed the branches in the troughs in full view of the flocks and they would breed in front of the branches. As for the weaklings of the flocks, he did not put out the branches. So it turned out that the weak sheep belonged to Laban and the stronger ones to Jacob. And the man became very rich. He had many flocks, female and male slaves, and camels and donkeys. This is the word of the Lord. Well, one reason for Jacob staying was his great love for Rachel who up until now had no child and, according to the customs of the time, was still under the protection of her father, Laban. Uh, And had Jacob left, Laban would have been within his rights to keep Rachel with him. That might seem a bit strange, but that was to protect the childless woman who might otherwise be discarded by an evil husband. But Joseph has been born and Rachel is recognised as Jacob's wife. Uh, and if you turn back just a couple of pages to chapter 28, uh, just before the memory verse in verse 13, uh, as I read, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land on which you are lying. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. And Jacob wants to go home. Back to the land promised to him and to his offspring that has now increased to 11. He has fulfilled his obligations and now he wants to go home. And I think all of us are like that in a way. Not now, I hope. But like Jacob, we want to go home. Not the places that we stay on earth but to our heavenly home, our heavenly country. In Philippians 3.20, Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we still have work to do as well, and we still have obligations that God wants us to fulfil. Now, I'm not comparing Laban to God, don't hear that. Laban should be compared to the world, Because just when we think we're moving up in the world, just when we think we're getting what we want in the world, the world changes the terms. And so as Christians, we've got to keep in mind that this world is not our home. This world can never give us joy or peace or satisfaction that will last. At the same time, God calls us to be in the world. And we are to occupy until he comes or until we are called home. So the reality is that there is no retirement from our Christian duties. We might retire from our jobs, but we are to never stop doing ministry and serving the Lord and sharing the gospel with others. Um, Verse 25 now, and sometime after Joseph was born, back in chapter 30, not 28 anymore, tells Laban, send me on my way so that I can return to my homeland. Give me my wives and my children that I have worked for and let me go. You know how hard I have worked for you. He doesn't ask for any other payment than his wives and children. The deal that Laban put upon him when he first tricked him all those years ago. Nothing extra for increasing Laban's wealth these last 14 years. But Laban is not willing to give up his cash cow or or sheep, as the case may be. If I have found favour with you, you must be joking. Jacob has no possessions, no flocks, no herds, not even a pet lamb. I don't think there would have been too much favour going around. But Laban knows how and why he has been blessed having Jacob around. Now, the word in verse 27 is divination, but it could also be experience. And as much as Laban is an idol-worshipping pagan, as we're reminded in the next chapter, 
Blind Freddy could see that Jacob, by the power of his God, was the reason for Laban's success. And it's a mocking of Laban's own household gods that they aren't able to do for him what Jacob's God has achieved. And Jacob spells it out in verse 29, You know how I have served you and how your herds have fared with me, for you had very little before I came, but now your wealth has increased. The Lord has blessed you because of me. Remember God's promise? All people will be blessed through you and your offspring. Laban and his family are the first to benefit from this promise. But Jacob has stayed with Laban 14 years and has a family, the offspring promised. But it is time for him to do something for his own family, his own household. Because as long as Jacob stays in Laban's house, there can be no house of Israel. I'm not sure where the line is, but somewhere in the negotiations, Jacob has moved from wanting to go home to staying around for what ends up being another six years. I don't think that this is a spur-of-the-moment idea from Jacob. I think this has been going around in his mind for quite a long time. But he says, don't give me anything, just do this one thing. I'm at point two on the outline now in verse 32. Uh, Now listen or read very carefully along with me. Let me go through all your sheep today and remove every sheep that is speckled or spotted, every dark-coloured sheep among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the female goats. Such will be my wages. In the future when you come to check on my wages, my honesty will testify for me. If I have any female goats that are not speckled or spotted, or any lambs that are not black, they will be considered stolen. Did you see Laban's face there? Or can you hear him scream out, you little beauty? Jacob has just offered his management skills, which obviously are first rate, in return for the hardest to breed and least desirable animals in the flock, especially the sheep. And most sheep at the time were white, which ironically is what Laban's name means. Remember Esau and red and the red stew? Well, he's Laban and white and white sheep. Most of the goats were black or very dark brown. So for his wages, he will take the small number of speckled, spotted or dark sheep and the spotted or speckled goats. And in the future, only those types will be his and Laban and his sons can easily discern if Jacob has stolen any of their animals. Quick as a flash, Laban says, good, let it be as you have said. Laban has just struck the deal to end all deals. To make doubly sure, Laban, the sneaky deceiver, goes straight out to the flocks with his sons. Now, wait a minute, sons? We've heard all about his two daughters, but now we know that he had sons as well. Well, there is a twist waiting to happen, isn't there? But lock that away for next week. I'm at point three now, and once again, I want you to listen or read very carefully with me verse 35. That day, that day, Laban removed the streaked and spotted male goats. Who was supposed to do the removing? And all the speckled and spotted female goats every one that had any white on it and every dark-coloured one among the lambs and he placed his sons in charge of them. He put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob. Now it's time to imagine Jacob's face and Jacob's exclamation when he went out to the flock. I'm not sure that what Jacob said would be repeatable when he went out and found an almost completely white flock and a completely dark flock of goats. Jacob thought he was going out to set aside his wages for the time past in the form of a small flock of misfits with which to breed up something to make for his own family. 
Instead, he finds his wages have been changed yet again. All the animals he requested, apart from the speckled or spotted sheep, have been separated out and moved three days away while he is left with Laban's flock to look after. Seven years ago, Jacob said, give me my wife, and Laban had withheld Rachel, violating their agreement, making him work another seven years for her. Now he says, don't give me anything, and Laban takes the most of takes most of the animals that Jacob requested once again, violating their agreement. The deceiver was deceived again. But I think it's time that we cut Jacob a bit of slack. Certainly he was a deceiver and a grasper, and what he did to Esau and to Isaac was terrible at best. But in all the time he has been with Laban, he hasn't complained or reneged on his part of the agreements, no matter how badly he was treated and tricked. He has worked hard and he has worked well. And in this, he reminds me of his son Joseph, who in years to come would spend about 13 years of faithful obedience in despair and disappointment, mostly in jail, without complaining but trusting in God. This same discipline of disappointment, I want you to remember that terms. I didn't make it. It's come from a book that uh, Bernard lent me, but it's fantastic. The discipline of disappointment. That God has been using on Jacob, that he used on Joseph, he's working on him and he is learning more and more to trust God whose word is worth trusting, no matter what is going on around him. And one of the best things about Jacob is he's just like us. Saved according to God's promises to him and, and to us, but fallen and failing. Like Jacob and Joseph, we too must trust God's word in faithful obedience, resting in his grace alone. When we do, we can know that life will be lived rightly. It might not be comfortable, it might not be easy, but it will be right. I'm at point four now in Jacob's breeding program. Um, after Laban's raw deal, it would have taken Jacob more than a lifetime to breed up a worthwhile number of the type of sheep and goats that he'd specified in the arrangement. But remember the memory verse. Just trust me. In a former life, I was a wool grower, a wool classer and sheep breeder. People wanted me to class their wool, class their sheep, and they wanted to buy our ewes and rams. I reckon I know a thing or two about sheep. Unlike cattle, where black skin and hair is dominant, to get large amounts of black skin and wool on sheep, you need two parents that carry the recessive gene to produce a mostly black lamb. And even then, not many will produce a completely black lamb. But what's good old Uncle Laban done? He's taken all those lambs three days away, hasn't he? He didn't take the few speckled or spotted sheep, and I say a few because they weren't desirable. And Jacob, being the good stud manager that he was, there wouldn't have been too many in the flock. And there certainly wouldn't have been any rams that weren't all white. Remember that for later. And the same with the goats, only worse. All the streaked and spotted goats, both male and female, every one that had white on it, were all gone. Three days' journey. There was next to no chance that goats would be born from what was left that would have any white on them at all. Can you see Jacob's problem? Laban has stolen the future that Jacob planned to build for himself and his family out from under his nose. And this is why God's promise is so important. For Jacob to prosper here, it is not going to be anything to do with Jacob or his outlandish breeding program. I can categorically tell you that no spotted, no speckled lambs kids were born because Jacob put branches with peeled bark in the water troughs. Just like 
they're not here, so they'll excuse me. Just like no red-headed babies were born in the Whiteman household because Elizabeth drank black tea when she was pregnant. But God, the promise keeper, is with Jacob always. And there were born, much to Laban's surprise, no doubt, many streaked, speckled and spotted sheep and goats. Now, without going into next week's passage too much, in chapter 31, God tells Jacob in a dream what caused his success. Verse 12, God said to Jacob, Look up and see all the males that are mating with the flocks are streaked, spotted and speckled. Do you remember what I said before about the rams? Earlier in verse 9, Jacob tells his wives plainly that God has taken away your father's herds and given them to me. This makes Jacob's breeding strategy all the more ridiculous, doesn't it? And I think that that is what Moses wants us to see when he wrote this. Just as it was God's plan about when Leah and Rachel would or wouldn't have children, not magic and mandrakes, Jacob's amazing increase in prosperity was all of God and not, as one writer calls it, Jacob's folklorist magic. It's clear from verses 7 and 8 of chapter 31 that Laban was still up to his old tricks as well, changing the wages to suit himself. He must have seen after a year or two that Jacob was doing exceedingly well, despite his best efforts to make sure that that didn't happen. And so maybe not ten times, but at least twice, he changed the agreed specifics of the contract. Jacob tells his wives, he has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God has not let him harm me. If he said the spotted sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born spotted. If he said the streaked sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born streaked. So once again, there are those two great words, aren't there? But God. But God in his mercy and his grace was keeping his promise. I will be with you always. They're familiar words, aren't they? It shouldn't surprise us that those words are repeated by Jesus. And we heard them in the Matthew reading. Jesus says it directly to his disciples, but they're words for us too, aren't they? They are at the same time a great comfort and a great challenge. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Back to Genetics 101. As the lambs and kids were born, striped, speckled, dark, Jacob separated them out and didn't let his flocks mix with Laban's anymore. The next part of his program had to do with quality, not quantity, and this even has some merit as the stronger, more vigorous animals would generally produce stronger, more vigorous and therefore hardier offspring, better equipped to handle drier times and and less likely to be susceptible to illness and predators. So Jacob worked hard. I'm at point five now. He was a very good sheep herder. I'm not sure that he was trusting God alone, but God in his great mercy and grace prospered him greatly. Unbelievably so. Verse 43 says, The man became very rich. He had many flocks, female and male slaves, and camels and donkeys. Now, wait a minute. Slaves and camels and donkeys? Further proof, if you needed any, of God's miraculous involvement. At most, this is just six years from when he had nothing other than his wives or children. So amazing has been his success that his increasing flocks have allowed him to acquire camels, which only the very rich had, and donkeys as well as slaves to look after his growing household and flocks. But don't forget, Jacob has no merit of his own to claim. He is a slowly reforming idol worshipper being transformed by God's patient grace into a faithful follower of the one true God. There is nothing in Jacob for God to favour him at all, let alone in this abundant way. 
This is so far above what Jacob had prayed for back in chapter 28 when he said, if God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I'm making, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear. God has answered Jacob's prayer far beyond all that he could ask or even imagine. God is teaching Jacob that he is his portion. He is the source of his blessing and that Jacob cannot outpray God. So what does all this mean for us on Monday or next week? The first thing I want to say is what it does not mean, how it cannot be applied. Jacob becoming one of the richest men in his time is not a recipe or a prescription for success and wealth. God is not just blessing and prospering Jacob in response to his prayer or his hard work. Far more importantly, this is God covenantally prospering Jacob, keeping the promise that he made to Abraham in Genesis 12 and reaffirmed with Jacob in chapter 28. Sadly, we are so tainted by the world that prosperity is so attractive to us. It's certainly not in the New Testament. There is not much health, wealth and happiness in there. There is a lot of joy, joy in all sorts of circumstances. It's God who should get the credit for all the good outcomes of Jacob's breeding program. But Jacob is playing his part as a hard-working, good shepherd, trying to get enough together to take him back to the land that God has promised him and his offspring. And like Jacob, we have our part to play, and often it will be hard work. It might be disappointing in whatever it is that God calls us to do. And John Chalker, our vicar back at Tambar Springs, always warned not to take the analogy too far, but he liked to compare it to a rowboat. The boat and one oar are God's and the other one is ours. If we pull God's oar in and just swing on ours, well, we'll go round and round in circles, won't we? Now, of course, God can make the boat go wherever he likes, but he wants us to pull on that oar in unison with him, to read his word, to walk with him, to be at one with him. It's God who saves sinners, but we have a role to play in evangelism. It's God who gives the growth of the church, but we physically, spiritually and financially have a role to play. It's God who answers prayer, but we have a role to play and so on. Uh, You might have been surprised at Jacob's household being a den of superstition and magic, but we shouldn't be. He is just a product of his culture and his idol-worshipping heritage. His great-grandfather Terah worshipped other gods, and that is where God called grandfather Abram from to set set him apart to worship the one God. But Jacob's mother, Rebekah, came from the same land of idolatry and here Jacob is in the land for 14 years plus another six to come. His uncle practices divination and his wife, Rachel, steals the household gods. Jacob himself doesn't get rid of the household gods for another few years in chapter 35. But you are just like Jacob, aren't you? And I'm just like Jacob. Now, you mightn't have a statue on your mantelpiece that you pray to, but we all have our own gods. We all like to do things our way, and like Jacob, we live in this pagan, idolatrous culture, and we've been in our whole lives. It is so easy to listen to the wisdom of our age, isn't it? You're finishing school and deciding about uni, Whose priorities do you use to make that decision? Do you go to college where all the cool kids go, that culture is loose and fast and free? Or do you choose the one that has a connection to a church or has a healthy Christian presence? 
Maybe you are young and single and desperate to have a wife or a husband or, or perhaps you're older and have lost a husband or a wife and you're longing for companionship. Well, the world says it doesn't matter. It's all good. Love is love. Do what you want. What's marriage matter anyway? But God's word is true. He can be trusted. And sexual expression outside of a one-man, one-woman marriage is outside of and a rebellion to God's word. Or what about your work? Do you go for that job that makes it harder to be physically present for your spouse and your children or for your Christian family because it pays more or, or offers more prestige? Or do you say no to that job or that promotion, live with less, so the important formative years of your marriage and your children's lives get the best of you, not just what's left over? Or your retirement, what are you doing with your retirement? Who is guiding you in what you do with your time? Um, remember how I said earlier, Jacob and then Joseph lived faithfully obedient lives under the discipline of disappointment. Well, there is one who exemplified that even more, isn't there? Despite Jacob being the chosen father of the Israelite nation, he was no prefiguring of Jesus. But his son Joseph certainly was. God used sinful men to ruin Joseph, but God raised Joseph out of that pit and placed him in a position of power. Just as God used sinful men to crucify Jesus, but God raised him from the dead, gave him the greatest position of power, and, and now Jesus is the only way of salvation. Joseph saved the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And Jesus has eternally saved God's ultimate chosen people. Jesus was only able to do this because he didn't take the easy, comfortable, non-threatening path, the very one that Satan tempted him with. Though it meant anguish, despair, terrible pain and eventually death, Jesus was faithfully obedient to God's word. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are or what stage your life is at. You have to make decisions. You have to live your life. God's word is what must dominate your thinking. It must determine your path. God's way, the right way, might not be easy. It might not be comfortable. You may have disappointment. But God, by his spirit, will be with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jacob. Thank you that as we've traced um, your hand of promise and providence in the life of Jacob, that we too can see your hand of promise and providence upon us. Help us to trust in you and be obedient to you no matter what is happening in our lives, so that we would learn to see your hand in every circumstance, that we might love you above all else, praising you as the God who provides and the God who sustains, the God who is himself our everlasting inheritance. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.